Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Good Bit Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us this week. This week's episode is all about the modern-day Martin McDonough classic, which is In Bruges, starring Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, and Ray Fiennes, a stellar cast and a stellar guest again joining us this week. Everybody, say hello to Robert McCahill joining us this week on the podcast. Thanks very much for your time today. Robert, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Uh, I feel like I've not seen you in the longest time. I know, it's been ages, mate. It's been ages. I've been, I've been as you know, like really, really busy, so... Busy boy. Yeah, I, the, the usual way that I, I meet you and see you at work and stuff hasn't really been aye. there for me the last few months. I've, ju- I've just been rushed off my feet. Aye. Well, let's talk about that then. Let's talk about how we met, because we first started a new job on the same day. That, that was the first day we met, wasn't it? It was. It was. Um, I think so. The uh, the I the the training day. It was. I feel like it was like a big like mass joining of loads of people, um, because there was loads of us. There were a good like thirty odd people joining the team. I don't know what had happened before. If there was like a mad exodus or something, <laughs> and folk were just leaving. I <laughs> <laughs> so we both started the same day, and it was lovely. We got to know each other and stuff like that. And then we later found out we've got the same birthday. Isn't that right? I, that was that was really weird. I was just thinking that there when you were talking about how we Aye. we met that day. Um, I and we both do a bit of acting. We both get the same birthday. We both the same job. It's like <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy the fact this is the first time you're on the podcast. Then since we've got so much in common, but welcome to the show. Thank uh, you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate me. your time. I appreciate your time. And as you say, we both do a bit of the acting. Um, what, what's been happening with that? I mean, I saw you were you were in town dressed as a as an old Scotsman recently. <laughs> what what was that for? I'm I'm hoping by old Scotsman you mean a Scotsman from olden times rather from the past than yes. an old Scotsman. <laughs> we have the same birthday, but you've got a few years on me. <laughs> um, so, uh, obviously, I just saw pictures was, uh, and I was like, "What's Rob up to?" <laughs> it was the Outlander Six premiere. Um, nice. And they, they were showing it at the Glasgow Film Theatre as part of the Glasgow Film Festival. Um, so an American production company had who were who were working for Stars Play, who are new the the new distributors for hmm. um, Outlander, had decided nope. that they were going to put on this immersive production um, in the city centre um, hourly throughout the day, and then. At the the actual um, premiere. Premiere, cool. Um, so it it was really cool, man. Uh, it was really cool. It was nice to know that someone in New York had looked at me <laughs> and doing a a, a self tape and singing. And oh, really? Had me freaked out. Had had thought he's the guy for us. So that was that was lovely. It was lovely. Cool. What what did you sing? Um, Wild Mountain Time. Wild Mountain Time. Oh yes, the, the edition. Um, I will not Classic. be singing now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. It was a it was a one and done audition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like um, that, that Wild Mountain Time song is like when when I was at drama college, someone said we're we'll good like a singing class or whatever. Bring a Scottish folk song, and there's about six of us that brought that one in, and that's I, a really good one because it's like it's a good traditional heritage song. Yeah, definitely. Um, and can I, I? I thought that's what they'd be looking for for the addition because of the Aye, part. Of um, but it turns out, like a couple of people I know who who also performed at it, one of them sang uh, "Fat and Bottomed Girls" <laughs> in <laughs> his addition <laughs> video, which I thought was amazing. But about a queen, Aye. your addition would exactly. be a, a traditional Jacobite. Let's sing Freddie Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, if you can make it work for yourself, then that's all that matters, you know. That's a brave choice, um, isn't it? So, you, was you in Outlander season six? No, no, no. Right, okay, cool. I was just wondering in case maybe you had a part in the show. Nah, unfortunately not. Um, I've not quite reached those heights yet. <laughs> no, I know. No, me neither. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if Outlander would be for me. I feel like you need to grow facial hair, and I just can't do that. I can't grow any facial hair. Well, this this is as good as my facial hair gets. I, I, like I can't yeah. grow one of those like proper no. beards, a proper man beard. Aye, um, 
So I. I'd like that. I'd like a man beard or, or at least some sort of facial hair. I just think I'd, I'd look different with it. <laughs> I don't know. Well, <laughs> I, I, I grew this for a part. Um, yeah. In a, in a feature film. Um, and that was about a year and a half ago. Um, mm-hmm. And apparently I suit it. So I've decided that I'm keeping it. Although I've got to shave it for a play that's coming up next month. But I'll be growing it back okay. straight away. Nice. And so, what are you coming up then? Play next month? Is that the one at the Webster's? So, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got two coming up next month. Um, I've Look at you, busy, busy actor. <laughs> I've got three nights down at the, the Beacon in Greenock. Um, oh, nice. In Moniton, which is a play about the oh, history right. of Greenock Martin. <laughs> um, my beloved Greenock Martin. I wonder how you managed to get that part. Jeez, well. <laughs> but the guy who wrote it, Davy Carswell, um, he also wrote the Benny Lynch story and the Tommy Burns story, which is just going into oh, cool. the Kings. Um, and he reached out to me on Twitter. He, he, he knew that I was a, a big Morton fan. Obviously mm-hmm. knew that I did a bit of acting. And, um, somebody had dropped out the cast and they needed a kind of a replacement with six weeks to go. Aye. So... I get to be on stage with Andy Ritchie. No, to, Andy Ritchie will mean nothing to you, right? But Andy Ritchie right. was my hero when I was 10. <laughs> he, so, was, he was a Scottish footballer of the year in 1979 when I was five. He was like, right, there you hero. go. So the, this is, the whole thing's worth it, just to share a stage with Andy Ritchie. Absolutely. It shows you like perspective, doesn't it? Like I, I, you said that as if like, I won't know you know anything about them and like fair enough but you do do you know what I mean it's like your hero you know yeah. what I mean so that's the sort of goals that you're happy to kind of go for and stuff like that which is which will be a that's a moment you remember for a long time do you oh, know what definitely. I mean like, being on definitely I mean I've got a t-shirt with a guy's face on it do you know what I mean <laughs> don't wear that to the hairs <laughs> I was thinking I might actually wear that on the night <laughs> 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 or maybe donate your t-shirt to him you can say I've got this all the time <laughs> so what else um, is coming up then so that's, that's that's one that's close to your heart what else is coming up so I've got this is where we got off at Webster's the following week um, it's an, a new play a couple of young playwrights um, getting a bit of attention a full page spread in the, the Evening Times the other night I saw that um, I saw that apparently the creator of Two Pints of Lager and a Packet of Crisps has read the play and absolutely loves it. Nice. Um, so, I, I'm, I mean, it's only one night. We had another night in East Kilbride, but for whatever reason, that was cancelled. Um, oh, really? But there's talk of potentially a tour towards the end of the year. Um, so, I, it's, it's exciting times, Chris. It's exciting time. That's kind of what happens with theatre, isn't it? Like, you, you kind of see if something goes well, then we'll do more of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But a lot of it's trial and error. A bit like just doing your own stuff, like whether it's writing something or doing a podcast or something like that. Like, you just need to see what happens. If it goes well, we'll do more. So, you know, you never know how that'll go. Yeah. If it's getting a good write-up, do you know what I mean? Then it's down to you guys, and I'm sure you will knock out the park. So I'll be there. I'll come see it. <laughs> come and see me murdering a Yorkshire accent. <laughs> I was like, when you said murder, I was like, you're giving away like a big plot point here. But I didn't <laughs> no, I think that I think good. it's safe for me to let everybody know that it's set in Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. I'm there. I'll be there. Um, no, I think I've already got tickets, so I'll be there on whatever day that is. So that's good. Um, and I'll, I'll link tickets to wherever wherever I can. Um, talk to me about um, when you started acting. Then so. I feel like this is like a relatively recent thing for you, isn't it? You you started. You, I yeah. don't know if you've always been performing, but it was it was recently you joined an acting course. Tell us about that. So, um, I I started acting, God, a little less than four years ago. Um, I have not, have not led the traditional uh, actor's life, probably. <laughs> Uh, I I had issues with addiction and stuff in my past, um, and and that swallowed up a a large part of my life. Um, and four years ago, well, before years in June, um, I came out of rehab after spending a year in rehab. I was going to play football for an over thirty five Fitba team one Friday night with my pal who who ran the Fitba team. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to print off team sheets for the referee. 
His printer wasn't working. We popped into an internet cafe and bumped into a guy who runs a theatre company who my pal Matthew knew. He asked Matthew if he had any actors for him. Matthew jokingly went, I big Robert. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he persuaded me to go and read for a small part on the Sunday night, which I did. Um, half ten on the Sunday night, he called me back and he said, listen, we were really, really impressed. We want to offer you the lead. Um my, my ego kicked right in and without <laughs> any idea what I'd signed up for, I went, yes, I'm there. Um, and then realised <laughs> slowly over the next couple of weeks that I had, it was a two-hour play. My character was in something like 23 out of 26 scenes um, <laughs> and I had six weeks to learn the lines and I'd never learned lines before. Of course, yeah. Um, so, but it was an, an absolutely amazing experience. I loved every minute of it. Um, I spoke to somebody I was really close to who who said to me, if this is something that sets your soul on fire, go and pursue it. Um, right. So there was the ne- very next day, there was an open day at Glasgow Kelvin College had come up on my news feed on Facebook. I clicked on it. One of the courses was an HND in acting and performance. So I went along to the open day. Again, this shows you where I was at. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know it was an addition. I, I had nothing prepared. <laughs> right. I thought I was just going to turn up and they'd take my name and stuff and ask me to come back. <laughs> and you've told me this before. That's right. I remember that now. <laughs> and the the head of the um, performance course at, at Glasgow Kelvin um, asked me to do some improv stuff. I kind of put my heart into it, and at the end of it, she said to me, "There's something there, Robert. I'm going to take a chance. I'm 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 going to give you an unconditional offer." Um, so, like, two weeks after my first ever stage performance, I was doing an HND and acting wow. performance. <laughs> um, and that was three and a half years ago, and I'm just about to graduate for wow. UWS, where we are an honours degree in performance. Brilliant. Um, and I mean, even though you've got a dissertation to do, and it's, it's driving you nuts, but still, it's going to be worth it at the end. <laughs> aye, aye. Um, and I've applied to, to go and be a drama teacher. Um, oh, brilliant! So I, I like lots of opportunities opening up, both in the acting world and in the work world. Mm. Aye, and it's funny how it works sometimes, man. Like, just you just so happen to be with your pal who knew someone who was like, "We're looking for someone," like right place, right time. Do you know what I mean? To make it even stranger, they had went to another cafe before that one, and it was too full for them to have the production meeting in that they were having. Whoa! So they, they just this was their second choice of like where they're going to have Aye. a meeting. Yeah. Um, so I'm 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 a big believer in kind of serendipity and fate and stuff like that. Right. Um, and, and looking back on it now, this was all supposed to happen. This was the path that my life was supposed to take. Yeah, and it happened like just as you were getting like like clean and all that stuff, and you're in a great place now and stuff like that. So, um, no, I'm very happy to see you always busy and stuff like that. So that's really good. Um, what else have you been doing? What else like happened after that? Did you do? I know you wrote some stuff. Did you do any short films? What else was kind of on your on your cards? God, I think in the last three and a half years, I've not really stopped. I've kind of, <laughs> I've got through the last half three and a half years by going. If I can get through this week, it will be all right. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll relax next week, <laughs> <laughs> and next week never comes. Um, no, I know. Like I think, like mon- Monoton and uh, this is where we got off. Will be my thirteenth and fourteenth stage performances wow. in that time. I've done about 15 short films, a couple of music videos, um, an advert that was on STV, uh, just finished, just wrapped on a, a feature film yesterday, which was another like, kind of surreal experience. Um, I, I, was, I saw was you posted original. a picture of you like, lying on the ground, and I was like, oh, he's up to something there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, that was me just after I'd regained consciousness. Um, I, <laughs> just been hit over the head with a butt of a gun um, right. and, and been knocked out. Um, but was, in the film, hopefully, not just in the day. Aye, aye, aye. This aye, was, aye, aye. <laughs> this was in the that, aye. <laughs> <laughs> But aye, it was, it was another bizarre experience. Um, I was originally cast as a character who, who had one day on set and one line um, and knew... 14 filming days later, my character has the highest body count in this gangster movie. (laughs) (laughs) 
what is why is that such a normal thing to think about in like an acting world do you know what I mean like that doesn't even face it's like I know right fair enough now you're in, <laughs> you've gone from one line to being in every scene I love that I it's, it's, uh, I it's just again it's another example of just how sometimes being in the right place at the right time um, and in this I, industry is all that needs to happen you know what I mean um, totally um, so you you studied at Glasgow Kelvin Glasgow Kelvin, I did my HND, yeah. And then you went to UWS. So I studied at Glasgow Kelvin doing an NPA thing before I joined college when I was in school. I did like a vocational programme at Glasgow yeah. Kelvin. Um, so I'm assuming you were in like the kind of acting drama like department. So you would know some of the people who work there. Aye, yeah. Aye, what was it? Right. Who taught you? Leah. Leah, Leah Moorhouse. Oh my God, I, I was taught by Leah for a bit, yeah. <laughs> well, Leah's, Leah's actually in This Is Where We Get Off as well, which is mental. The person who was my original lecturer is now like on stage with me. I didn't know she was in that. I didn't know yeah. she was in that. So that's, that's going to be a bonus. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, so what about Mary? Leah. She's still there? Ma- it was Mary who did my initial audition. Yes. Um, Yvonne. I did not know Yvonne. No, uh, Demetrius. Demetrius was the movement guy. He was a dancer. Um, oh, wow, well, a name like that rings a bell, but um, I don't remember. It was Mary, uh, Leah, someone called Steph, Stephanie. Mm. I think I was only there for a year, so I didn't yeah. meet everybody. But um, I it was like a vocation thing. So that's that's funny. I didn't know that. I I, I knew you were at UWS, but I, I forgot you'd went to Kelvin. That's funny. Yeah. Um. What about in terms of like watching movies then throughout your life? What was what was your first favourite movie, if you can remember when you were wee? Star Wars. Okay, Star good. Wars. Now, <laughs> what, what one was, did you watch the first? Did you watch like A New Hope first or was it? Yeah, I, A New Hope. I remember seeing A New Hope on Betamax video in, must have been about 1981, 1982. Wow. Um, and, and you've always been a fan? Aye. Yeah, I I, I kind of fell in love with Star Wars then. I mean, my, my doormat, who took my front door, is a Star Wars doormat, and it says, welcome to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I see those things, and I always say to myself, you know, when, <laughs> when I'm older, I'm going to get one of them. <laughs> Get to the stage now when I'm older, and I should probably buy one. <laughs> that sounds good. I was just, I was, I think it was like B&Q or something. I was walking through, or, or B&M, one of them, <laughs> being something. <laughs> and I just saw it, I was like, I'm going to buy that, because I just moved into this flat uh, in November. Aye. So I needed, I needed a new doormat. <laughs> that was it, last, last time we saw each other, you just moved in, wasn't it? We did that work, one work day in person. That's, That's right. right, yep, yep. Hi. How's it going? How, <laughs> how's the new place going? It's great, Chris. Aye, it's great. Um... The place I was in was was much smaller. I was in a studio flat for seven years. I'm now in like a proper one bedroom flat, loads of space, Aye, nice. space to get my wee puppy that I got just before Christmas. Um, I have different rooms that I can go and sit in if I'm studying and I'm bored or whatever. So I, I, it's it's just been it's been nice. Great. Um, do you remember the first time you ever went to the cinema? That's a question that I always bring up, and I just realised now I forgot to text you earlier on and, and tell you I was going to ask you this. <laughs> um, but if you can remember off the top of your head, uh, the first time you went to the cinema, or any I, early cinema memories? I can't remember the first time I went to the cinema, but when I was about 12, I had a paper round in Greenock. And there were groupies who were paper boys who would all go to the Saturday afternoon matinees. Um, right. Um, so you're talking about 1986-ish. And I remember seeing things like Brewster's Millions. I remember seeing The Return of the Jedi. Um, what else? God, it was, it was like every Saturday for months we used to go. Yep. Um but yeah, I'm they, kind of in that they, routine now, where like I, I'm trying to, me and my mates have got those Cine World Unlimited cards, so yeah. you can just go and see whatever you want, um, and that's kind of the reason why we started this podcast years ago, but um, we kind of, everyone kind of does their own thing now and is busy and stuff like that, but we used to have like every Thursday we would go to the cinema regardless of what was on, it could be like a big blockbuster that just came out, or it could be something that we've never heard of, 
Uh, and we'll just see it. You know, back in the day where it was like just one film that was on in the cinema, and that was the film of the week, and you would just go and see whatever was on. Yeah. So I try to treat it like that a wee bit. Do you know what I mean? That's kind of the decisions made for you. Um, so now we've figured out that like Tuesdays are the kind of best day for us. So we've seen like things like the Batman, you know, we saw Spider-Man late last year. These are, like big films, right? Then like last night we went to our sunny world night on a Tuesday. We saw a film called X. Have you heard of this one? No, no. Uh, so me neither. And one of my favourite parts about going to the cinema is like, especially smaller films, is that like you're going to find ones that are like wee hidden gems. Yeah. You know what I mean? That you've maybe not heard too much about. I don't like watching too many trailers and finding out too much about it because I like that kind of going in unknown. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like fully having that experience. Oh, so definitely. last night we saw this one called X. I'm looking at its IMDb page here, right? I said it's like a horror and a slasher film. And at first of all, I didn't even know it was a horror. <laughs> I knew it was about... Um, it's about it's in 1979 and it's about a group of young filmmakers set to make adult films. And they go on to a farm to make these adult films. Yeah. And the people who own the farm aren't happy with the fact they're making adult films. That's all I knew about it. So I thought it was going to be like a kind of American comedy, smut-based comedy. It yeah. turns out to be this absolutely mental horror film <laughs> about these people who are who are making pornos and like the people who own the farm like want to get involved and they just it's like this it's mental i just i didn't expect it whatsoever um and it's by tia west ty west um i ty west i don't know anything else about him he did vhs um, i don't know how it was a big film um he did the resident the passage the exorcist the remake of the exorcist um and the valley of the shadows these are quite big films i suppose but uh, i so i just knew nothing about it and I was pleasantly surprised so there's one I'd, I'd recommend if you're looking to go to the cinema anytime mm-hmm. soon that was a good one I, it's something that I do now and again I've not I've not been to the cinema a lot over the last two years obviously with the whole right, it's tough, right? Things carry on and stuff but it, it was something that if I was at a loose end obviously with student discount and stuff like that or, or during the week where you can get into the view for like a fiver um, I would just pop along and, and much like you see what was on and, and um, anything yeah but my, my last cinema experience <laughs> I went I went to the cinema on Valentine's Day on a date nice um, and I let her pick the film and I ended up watching Jennifer Lopez and Marry Me <laughs> <laughs> Now, again, I don't like watching trailers and stuff. All I saw was the poster, and I took one look at it, and I said, I will not be seeing that one. <laughs> one out of ten would not recommend. <laughs> really? <laughs> for, for what it was, like a date night movie with a girl, I suppose, yeah. Um, but I would never have chosen it in a million years. No. I mean, don't get me wrong, there has been some like films like that that I thought, I'm never going to see this or whatever, and then you end up going for one reason or another and going, oh, that was actually all right, but you're not going to recommend Marry Me? No. So <laughs> <laughs> I had to hear. Uh, I went to the cinema on a date one time to see that Valentine's Day, like it was called Valentine's Day, yeah. and I went to see it on Valentine's Day, and like I was trying to build like, romantic and stuff, do you know what I mean? And it just, it just didn't work out whatsoever. I was like, what a terrible decision. <laughs> you need to be careful with these things though because you need to pick a film that you think they're both going to like but it needs to be something like um, kind of caters to your personality that, so it's not going to be a horrible experience yeah. you know what I mean Yeah. Um, what was the last one I went on like a date wise and like obviously so I'm, I'm with someone now and I'm very happy but this is before this <laughs> um, I went on like a date to the cinema I saw a film called um, The Call The Call of the Wild A Call A Call to the Wild is that what it's called? The Call of the Wild, it's called. And it the is um, the, the, Harrison the Ford. Greg Lindon one? Uh, possibly. Uh, directed by Chris Sanders. Um, I think, well, maybe a remake. Yeah. Maybe uh, a Jack remake London maybe wrote before. the book, The Call of the Wild. So right, I'm just assuming go. that it was that. Was that about a wolf? So, it was more, it was a dog. They'd made it a dog this time. Right. Aye, Jack London. So so by Jack London, 1935 film is what it was based on. So it's Harrison Ford with a dog, a CGI dog. Cool. So when I emailed you about doing, or not emailed you, but I messaged you about doing the podcast today, I said, you can pick the film, what you want to do? Um, and pretty quickly, you chose this Martin McDonough classic in Bruges from 2008. 
Um, tell me why. Why Why was in Bruges your, your go-to choice? I don't know. It's, it's, it's one of those films, Chris, that I just love everything about it. Uh, I love Martin McDonough's writing. I love him as a playwright um, and, and yep. as a, a screenwriter. Um, Brendan Gleeson is one of my favourite actors. Um, the the storyline is it's so typically a Martin McDonough storyline. It's so dark, um, and yet he manages to find the the moments of humour, and it he makes the characters these really despicable characters, and he he, he makes them likable and human. Totally. Um, Aye, it's it's just it's it's a fantastic movie. I could watch it over and over again. It's probably one of the movies in the last maybe fifteen years that I've watched them the most times. It totally flies by as well. Do you know what I mean? Like it's such an easy watch. Um, yeah. So the first time I seen this was a few years ago, and someone for my birthday bought me, which is on August twentieth, as you know, uh, bought me a poster. And it was that um, 100 movies bucket list poster thing. Yeah. Where it's like 100 squares. And then you see the film and you can like scratch it off like a scratch card. And it reveals like a wee kind of small cubed picture of the movie, right? So in the end, you're going to have this cool poster of 100 wee pictures. Yeah. Um, and I remember like, there's obviously those classics on there. There's like the Shawshank Redemption, The Dark Knight, Godfather, Jaws, Star Wars, all these things on this poster. And I was like, there's going to be like big films like that. But there's a few on there that I'd like, what is this? Never even heard of this one before. And one of them was in Bruges. And I was like, never even heard of it. Um, so I was trying to, I was going through a phase where I was trying to watch through them all. That, that ended up not working, but... um. I was trying to watch through them all, and I thought, there's one I've not heard of, let's start with that one. And I remember watching it and just being like, what an underrated classic. And I feel like since I'd watched it, a lot more people know of it. Yes. Um, and I hear about it a lot more now, now that I know what it is. Do you know what I mean? Maybe that's just a subconscious thing. Maybe I heard about it plenty before and didn't clock on to the fact that I didn't know what it was. But now that I have seen it and stuff, and now that I can like recognise it, I was like, oh yeah, what a classic film. When did you first see it? Did you see it when it came out in 2008? It would have been run about then, aye. Um, and I think, look, looking back at it, I, I think it was really critically acclaimed, but I don't think it was a huge right. box office success. It was Martin McDonough's directorial debut. Um, there weren't the, I mean, Colin Farrell was probably a bit of a star at the time. Brendan Gleeson mm-hmm. wasn't. Um, Ray Fiennes has never been like internationally recognised. Um so uh, it probably didn't do hugely well at the, at the box office. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah. uh, uh, as you say, over the years, it's kind of word of mouth. That, have you seen In Bruges? Have you seen, and more and more people are seeing it and recognising it for the classic bit of storytelling that it actually is. Aye. Aye. It's, um, for those who haven't seen it, it's about two hit men who have been sent to a, a city in Belgium called Bruges. Um, one of them, Ray, is it Colin Farrell? Ray, please? Aye, Colin yeah, Ray. Farrell's Ray, yeah. Aye, he has, I don't want to spoil anything, but he's done something uh, that is really, really bad. And his boss, I guess, Hitman boss, played by Ray Fiennes, tells them, go lay low for a bit in this city of Bruges. There's nothing to do there. It's a very touristy thing. You can just go about, go on a couple of boats, see a couple of buildings. And Ken, played by Brendan Gleeson, is he's much more into that stuff than than Ray is. And it's just about them trying to like survive in the city without being too bored. And um, Ray just continues some of the lines that Colin Farrell has in this film are just hilarious because he's just trying to like You're he's a put bunch his foot of in his mouth. Elephants. <laughs> that one. <laughs> That was the one that first set me off. Oh my god! <laughs> Colin Farrell just plays so against. Like no, no, I can understand that Colin Farrell is a really good actor, um, and and he's got a great range. But back then, he he was kind of being set up as that kind of Hollywood heartthrob type right. actor when, when he, um, he had done Alex. He, he played Alexander and Troy and. Um, what was the one? Phone booth. It, it was all these big budget Hollywood things. Um, yep. And this was the first time that I saw Colin Farrell kind of playing against that type. And he was fantastic. His vulnerability in this film is amazing, man. There's a, there's a scene or a bit where Ray Fine's character says, you can't 
Oh, I was going to spoil it. I just if, listen. If you're if you're listening and watching this podcast, you probably would have seen the film, right? So we'll just go for it. Spoilers for this on this point forward. He says you can't shoot a child and get away with it, right? And at that moment when he says that, I was like, oh, I like he's murdered a kid because he's so likable, Colin Farrell's character. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, you kind of feel yeah. bad for him, but you forget the fact that they're, they're hitmen and they've done this horrible thing. Do you know what I mean? And and that's I that's what I mean. It's like Colin Farrell. Brendan Gleeson and and Ray Fiennes all play these despicable characters. But there are moments for each of them in that film where you're like, he's actually all right. And you forget that that they're mad hitmen. (laughs) Aye, absolutely. And even the moment where like um, Ray Fiennes phones, his name's Harry, Harry phones Ken and tells him like, you're in Bruges so you can kill Ray. And it's this moment that Ken has and he's just like he just realises because he's kind of like good pals with Colin Farrow's character do you yeah. know what I mean like they're, kind of, they're actually a really good double act in this film good relationship um, so the fact that he's going to need to do that it's a really nice moment where he's like oh my god that like the realisation that he's going to need to kill his pal um, it's probably the best moment of his performance I think of, of the film as well I um, I think that that moment on the phone and then when when Harry and Ken are up the bell tower, um, and Aye. um ha- Harry turns around to Ken, eh, sorry, Ken turns around to Harry and tells him that he's not going to fight him, and he kind of lays out the the morality behind his decision not to kill Ray. Um, Aye. I, 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 again, I'm not going to spoil it by telling what happens no, next. I know. Um, but aye, there, there are just there are moment really tender, really warm human moments in it, which if somebody gave you a synopsis of the film, it's about two hitmen, one of whom has accidentally killed a little boy and their boss trying to extract revenge, you wouldn't think we're going to be there. Do you know what I mean? Right, absolutely. And I think I, there's some films that just because where they're set as well has like a kind of light-hearted kind of tone to it as well because it's like this is a nice touristy city there's probably not a lot of killing probably and murdering going on there do you know what I mean but I guess you never know you know what I mean and that's kind of a nice Bruges, kind of thing to see Bruges in becomes film. a character in the film Aye. Bruges actually takes on its own character with, within the film um, and I <laughs> I was just thinking about the the party scene Um but the <laughs> with a dwarf, you've got to call him a dwarf. He doesn't like being called a midget. Um, that's one of the lines in the film. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, the two prostitutes and uh, and there's this mad drug fueled rant about a race war and stuff like that. And you're like, where did that come from? <laughs> I think that's what he I, does, I mean, like Martin McDonough. Like some of the dialogue just comes out of nowhere really, and it's like a different tone. Some of, his, some of his stuff is just really, really surreal. His, his plays, some of his plays are really surreal. Um, and and I think I've noticed in his films, <laughs> aye, aye, there, there are, there's an air of surreality in a lot of his films as well. I don't know if you've, if, have you seen his, his first short film that he directed? Now what was that? Six shooter. Six shooter. I. Um, Brendan Gleeson's in that as well. I would. I would highly recommend watching it. Right, you, you're smiling. Is that? Is that? Is that even more surreal? Is it on YouTube? It's it's quite surreal, but it's really funny as well. It's on YouTube, yeah. Ah, it's on YouTube. It's only twenty seven minutes, I think. All right, got it. I'll watch it later. But I I, I like that. Mark McDonough kind of builds relationships with actors as well, and and. Because Colin Farrell and Brendan, Brendan Gleeson have appeared in a few of his films. Um, so he kind of gets, he, he builds this relationship and he trusts his actors and, and yep. you see the results in his movies, man. The other one that I know from, other than Three Billboards, I don't know if he directed that one, he definitely wrote it. Um, he did direct it, he did Three yeah. Billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Great film, absolutely um, recommended. Uh, Seven Psychopaths is the other one. Have you seen Seven Fantastic. Psychopaths? I've only watched it one time, and it was years ago, and I'd love to rewatch it. I reckon I'd like it even more now. Aye, uh, uh, it's a it's a great movie again, um, and again, 
quite surreal at times. Um, and the premise behind it is is a bit mental, but it still becomes this really enjoyable kind of watch. And I mean, Colin, that's Colin Farrell's film as well, isn't he? He's in that a lot. And, yeah. Um, do you know who else he's, like, he puts in lots of his films? Sam Rockwell, who is hilarious. Sam Rockwell is amazing. Good. Sam Rockwell is, is very underrated, man. Um, I love Sam Rockwell as an actor. What about any other of his of his plays then? Did you did you read any of Martin McDonough's plays? The Pillow Man. The Pillow Man's my favourite and lockdown I... robbed me of the opportunity to go and see it in the West oh, yeah, End sure. of London. Um, my fiance at the time had bought two tickets to, to go and see it in the West End for my birthday. Um, so it was my birthday weekend in 2020 we were supposed to go. Um, and obviously lockdown came in March. So by August, it just wasn't happening. Uh, Aye. So I'd, lo- I'd love the opportunity to go and, uh, go and see it performed properly, professionally in a, a big theatre. Aye. What a weird year 2020 was. See when you think back to it, like, how crazy was that year? It, it, it was pretty mental. <laughs> it was. It was. Because um, it, it just, it started like any other year. Um, and <laughs> they then, were all like, really optimistic because we're like, 2020. Like, <laughs> um, and just changed everybody's lives overnight. <laughs> A lot of people are saying, like, obviously, I don't know how people were in that first lockdown. A lot of people were in a lot of trouble and, like, were really ill and lost loved ones and things like that as well. But there's, like, parts of it that people end up missing because it was there was a very, there was a simplicity to that first lockdown and stuff. And people are saying, oh, just bring back first lockdown. And I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> no way. <laughs> well, it, you know what I mean? Was, it was strange because, like, I'd got back in touch with a lot of stuff that I had probably neglected because my life had got so busy. I loved to cook. So I was I was, right. I was cooking at home again. I was baking at home. I've, I was back out running. I've kind of neglected my fitness since I stopped playing football a couple of years back. Right. Um, I was back out running and stuff like that. And now that my life's busy again, like that stuff that I enjoy is falling by the wayside. So it, 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 it's mad that you're looking back at the first lockdown and going, aye, there were simpler times. <laughs> Simpler times, everything was shut. We didn't need to go for dinner anywhere. I couldn't even go and do anything. I think, like the the first lockdown, because it was a new experience. Aye, um, exactly. There and and we did get a bit of time to reconnect with stuff that we maybe had neglected in our lives. It wasn't that bad. But then by like lockdown two and lockdown three, most folk were like, Aye. we've had enough of this." <laughs> Thank you, boy. <laughs> Please go away, COVID. <laughs> Aye. Um, well, I'll tell you where COVID was not a big thing, and that is in Bruges. Um, um, that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's for a segue. It's totally very natural. Um, so, what about, let's talk about the ending. So, obviously, we, don't, we weren't going to spoil anything, but let's just say for the fact that like, if people are listening this far, they would have known what happens. The ending that Brendan Gleeson jumps from the building. Is, is, is like the Martin McDonough aspect of it, right? Where it's like that surreal aspect where he just jumps and you see the body like splat Aye, against the ground. The ground. Aye, that's a shocking one, but so good. Like the, the whole ending, it underpins the morals and values of these characters. Um, the, the way that Ken sacrifices himself to try and save Ray. Right. And then the way that Harry faces the consequences of or the perceived consequences of his own actions in relation to Ray's actions. Um, and, and it's like, it's difficult not to, because by this point I'd kind of fell out with, with, with Harry. I didn't really like him as a character, but it was difficult not <laughs> to respect him as a character right. for, for having the courage of his convictions. Do you know what I mean? You know, I thought it was really interesting when you saw him sitting with his kids as well, because all you'd, all you'd been told about him before was that like um oh he's this bad man he's the one they're waiting for the phone call ever but then you see like the human the human side of him yeah. he's sitting there in his house with his kids and stuff and he has to go to bruges and he's like why um and so i thought that was really interesting that they threw that in there like but that, it that humanizes whole, him as you say that whole scene as well kind of juxtaposes the two aspects of his character because it starts off with him on the phone and and right. going mental and smashing his phone up and then screaming at his wife 
and then the next time you see him in that scene, he's sitting down with his kids going, listen, daddy's got to go away. And it's like, aye, aye. those two polar opposites of his character. And I watched this again last night and I was like, I, I couldn't remember if Ray was killed in the end, like was, was he shot? Um, and I kind of wanted them to survive. As you say, he's a very likable character who's just so happened to have done a bad thing. Um, and I was kind of like gutted when he was shot on the boat, which is again, great shot, great ending. Do you know what I mean? As he's yeah. kind of going away on the boat. Like, I think that the actual end of the film is Ray on his way to hospital. And, and it doesn't clarify whether he lives right. or dies. Um, You're right. And I like that. I like that they left it open. Sometimes with movies, that's the best way to end them. Because in your imagination, it's like, right, this happened. Or that yep. happened. Do you know what I mean? You 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 draw your own ending, and I like that sometimes in a movie. It's like that kind of um, blur in the lines, and you kind of make up your own mind. And that saying that people say, uh, if you don't see a body, then there's no deed. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's kind of like, uh, oh, what's that Al Pacino film? Carlito's Way. Oh yes. Where at the yes, end, yes. Carlito gets shot, and you see him getting put into the ambulance, and you can you, you hear him talking his voiceover, but they don't actually tell you whether he lives or he dies. Um, Aye, and that's another of my favourite films, and I don't know if that's a running theme. <laughs> that at the end, the protagonist gets shot, <laughs> and you don't know whether he dies. Maybe it is. <laughs> so would you say that is like in Bruges? Maybe your favourite film. What is some some of your other favourite movies of all time? Uh, so I in in Bruges is is probably my favourite. As as I say, I can watch it over and over again, and every time I see it, I see something different in it. Um, yeah, love Carlito's Way, um, The Godfather Two, uh, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, God, these are all old films. <laughs> Not in Bruges. In Bruges well, two thousand eight. Still two thousand and eight, I think. So still fourteen years. Um, True. I can't even think of anything recently that I've really. I mean, I I, I did like three billboards. Um, that was good, yeah. I can't even think of anything else off the top of my head. Some of the Batman movies were really, really good. Um, did you see the new one? I've not seen it yet. It's it's next film I'm going to go and see at the cinema. I think. Obviously, it's getting a cracking write up and stuff like that, and I I really liked it. I just didn't think it was amazing. People were saying it was amazing, but I I really liked it. It's definitely definitely worth seeing. Do you know what I mean? And I think he's he's a really good Batman, Robert Pattinson. That that's actually just that reminded me of a film, a recent film that I really loved was the Joker. Joaquin Phoenix just I, he plays the part of a man disassembling mentally fantastically well. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't your typical Marvel movie, was it? It wasn't a, or DC. But I can I can never remember if Batman's Marvel or DC. Uh, Batman's DC. Uh, Batman's DC. Yeah, it was never. It was never that typical superhero type movie. It was far darker. It was very dark. I I, I like actors who commit, who who really commit, and and Joaquin Phoenix commits, man. Um, Definitely. I love Christian Bale as well. Christian Bale's another actor who who commits to the part. Um, An underrated actor, I think. Actually, underrated Batman as well. I think Christian Bale. He was a really good Batman. Really good Batman. Well, if you've got anything else to talk about in Bruges, then please do. But other than that, I mean, I think I think we're done. I think we're done here. Thank you very much for your time. No worries um, at all, Chris. Tell everybody listening and watching where they can find you. What you got on social media? You got uh, Twitter, Instagram, things like that. So I've got Twitter at, uh, at Robert McCahill 2 because I lost access to at Robert McCahill 1. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at Rabmac 1974 on Instagram if you want to see lots of pictures of my puppy and trainers and the occasional <laughs> acting thing. <laughs> and... I think I'm off Facebook at the moment, so you'll not find me on there. <laughs> no. Tell, tell us, before we go, I forgot about the trainers. Tell us about the trainers. I love that. So, um, aye, I've got a bit of a thing for Adidas trainers. <laughs> Just a wee bit. Um, I've probably got about 80 or 90 pairs of Adidas trainers. 
Um, the whole terrace culture, the football kind of culture when I was growing up, the kind of late 80s, early 90s, wearing Stone Island, wearing um, CP Company and wearing Adidas trainers. Uh, so since I got clean five years ago, um, and I don't spend any money on alcohol or drugs or anything. I've got nothing else to spend my money on other than clothes and trainers. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's well, I love the fact that it's like an actual collection. You know what I mean? You've got loads of them and it's like you'll you'll make an effort to go and get the new ones and things like that. Like that's that's like definitely well, a cool I, thing I, to have. I queue up like I've queued for like over 24 hours to get new pairs. Um, and some of them are investments. The, the, there's pairs that I've got that were 85, 90 quid that I will never wear that are now worth three and four hundred pounds. Um, so they'll go to my nephew's once I kind of slip this mortal coil. Hi, <laughs> Jesus. Right. Well, I that's uh, Uncle Goals. There you go. And that's going to be good. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, right. Cheers, Robert. Thanks very much for your time. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. Please stay tuned for another episode of the Good Bit Podcast coming very soon. And until next time, take care of yourselves. I'll catch you out down the road. Yeah.